Derek, Derek, Derek. Diamond, Diamond, Diamond. diamond. Experience! Welcome to episode 341 of the Derek Diamond Experience podcast. I'm your host, Derek Diamond. And this week, we're going to be concluding our look at the behind the scenes making of my latest short film, The Feature. Jeremy Branch will be back once again to guest host, and we'll be chatting with three of the six cast members. Last week, you heard from Jace, Samantha, and Jeff. This week, you'll be hearing from Rob Eubanks, who plays the role of Michael, Leah Christine Johnson, who plays the role of Maria, and Thomas Carter Rochester, who plays the role of Doug. And this was really fascinating to just kind of sit back. And and I I make a guest appearance uh, in the main portion of the show as well. Uh, But I really enjoyed just sitting back and listening to them talk about not just how they found out about the feature and, you know, their time in the production, but hearing them talk about preparing for a role in general and some of their background as far as being in acting and the whole process of it. As someone who doesn't act, it was really fascinating to hear, and I hope you think so as well. And I will say these three put on a great example of, because they're what I would consider more of supporting roles. They don't have a ton of screen time, but they make the most out of every moment that they are on camera in the feature. So I think if you're an aspiring actor, they're a great example of the fact that even if you don't have a ton of screen time, you can make the most out of what you do with what time you have. And I think the three of them put on a clinic when it comes to that example. So hopefully you enjoy this conversation. I'm going to shut up now. I'll be talking a little bit about the premiere coming up this weekend uh, on the other side of this interview. So sit back and enjoy the conversation with Rob, Leah, and Thomas. Welcome back to part three of our conversation about the feature. Uh, I'm joined again with Derek Diamond, as as I have been every time. I mean, this is your show after all, so uh, thank you for being here and setting this up. This is part three in our conversation in regards to his film, The Feature. So on part one, we were able to talk with Derek, as well as Steve and Chad, who were the uh, you know producer, assistant director, director, On the part two of the show, we were able to talk with a couple of the cast members. And here we are for part three, having a conversation with the remaining cast members from the movie. I think that there are some additional people that aren't going to be joined, but this is going to be a conversation kind of about that side of the process. I believe by the time this airs, we will have done the premiere on Thursday night. Is that correct, Derek? So this will air the Monday before the the premiere but oh uh, but a cool thing is so uh the trailer for the film will already be out by that point which uh the the cast got to see uh an early viewing of it uh before it's released to the public so really excited you know for people who that hopefully by the time you've listened to this you've watched it so how can i watch the trailer i'll send it to you when we're done recording how can they watch the trailer? Uh, head over to facebook.com slash the feature movie. It's also on Twitter and Instagram at the feature movie as well. I'll be sure to share it out as well. That's exciting. Yeah, uh, I am a fan of the movie. I'm very interested to see how the trailer uh, turned out. So without further ado, let's go ahead and introduce everyone to the panel. Um, as I get to you, just do me a favor. Tell me the name of your character and just a, the briefest synopsis about the character that you're playing. Starting with Rob Eubanks, how you doing, Rob? Good. I mean, I'm just like, I. I mean, is was I the boss, or was there? There was an actual name, though. I thought he did. Uh, Michael was your was your character's name. <laughs> so, like, so there you have it. The important part is that you were the boss. I, I was the boss, and I didn't know my lines. I just didn't know my name. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, Lee Johnson, welcome to the conversation. Oh, hi. Um, my character was named Maria 
and she's the actress that takes herself entirely too seriously and believes her own press, even if she may or may not be as talented as she thinks she is. And also joining us, last but not least, Thomas Rochester. How you doing? I'm doing well, Jeremy. It's good to see your beautiful mustache face. Well, thank you uh, so much. Yeah, man. Uh, my character's name is Doug, and he is Doug, comma, the greatest sound guy in the history of sound guys, asterisk, except Brandon Purdue. So I don't mean to be biased, but I, I got to lay my cards on the table. I, I have one credit on IMDb. I was a sound guy for Servi. So when I saw your character, mm. I just, I felt an immediate kinship and I appreciate yes. you representing the sound guy for, for all of the glory that, that they are. Yes. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Hey man, you're the, you're now the greatest sound guy in the I'll history of all sound guys, which I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to demote you from the position. Oh, Maybe we can funny. share the, the status. Co greats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right. Excellent. So, uh, yeah, um, the feature is Derek's second major project. Would you say that's fair to say, Derek? Yep, that is correct. And uh, obviously, this was a huge learning experience for you. We've talked about that a little bit in the past two discussions that we've had. I'm kind of curious about everybody else's level of experience. Um, Rob, is how many features have you been involved with leading up to this one? And also, how did Derek kind of rope you into this this uh, project? Um, I've uh, let me see. I think I've got I got 14 credits in the IMDb, and that's over the past five years, I guess. Um, so I've got an agent in New Orleans, and um, so I do you know, a handful of SAG stuff, like full big feature stuff um, a year. And then I self-submit through Actors Access for um, for non-union things. Um, and, and so I try and keep myself busy between both of those. Um, and uh, so this, I mean, when I saw, saw this come up in terms of auditions, for one, it was a live audition. And that's like, we never get the opportunity to do that anymore. And so I was like excited about the challenge of that. And then I knew of Derek, um, I think we might have met, we met before at the film festival, it was in another film that was at that, but just briefly. And uh, and it just sounded, it sounded like a cool project. And, you know, it, it's it's local and being a part of our local film community is is important. Um, I, I, I think we are really unique in this area um, that we have so many people, we have so much talent I mean, from, you know, all spectrums of the business, really, to be able to pull a crew together and, and you know, and that's a part of why this came out so well and why for me is such a great experience is because, you know, who he is, who he surrounded himself with, um, you know, from in an equipment and then just, you know, other actors that it, it's just, uh, it, it all makes a difference, but it also sp speaks so much to what we have in our area um, in terms of talent and interest in film. And it, it just, I really enjoyed it so that's kind of how i got involved as well too. excellent excellent uh leah kind of same question what what is your experience in acting and then how did you get involved with this project i have a degree in theater um <clears throat> and it's well it's actually musical theater with a vocal concentration i can sing but no i actually like honestly i like acting <laughs> more I, I actually get stage fright when i sing um but yeah i've been just i've been working in theater and film um voiceover and just about every hat that you can wear in the performing arts for over 10 years and i've also directed a lot of theater and some film very small projects but still it's been good um the biggest project that i worked on which was actually the first thing i worked on and my first lead role was in this movie called demon squad that was shot in mobile which i think is kind of how derek and chad found me because it was like I played a character that made them think of the of a line and they were like oh that makes sense so anyway um but yeah that actually got featured on Mystery Science Theater 3000 last summer um so if you want to great show wow That's check, out, check out the really? Mystery Science Theater. yeah cool. it's yeah it's pretty cool um 
I just, I love, I love the arts and I, I'm kind of like you, Rob, like I want to support the arts here as much as possible and make it as professional and legit and, and have people take it as seriously as they can here. Because I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of other places that are doing film and theater that people are more aware of, but you know, this is, this is a nice area and we do good work here and I want, I want people to recognize that. Yeah. I don't mean to you know, marginalized by saying there's so much untapped potential here because I think people are starting to realize the potential. But I mean, as far as from behind the camera to talent in front of the camera, the locations are amazing. I mean, mm. imagine the different ways that somebody could utilize a set like uh, Fort Pickens or something like that. I mean, I really do think there needs to be more attention, you know, on the Pensacola film community as a whole, because this place does have a lot to offer. And uh, Leah, that's actually really wild that that the movie was featured on Mystery Science Theater. I'm a huge fan of Mystery Science Theater, and it seems like they're not sleeping on Pensacola's uh, potential because we also got that. Uh, it was the Asylum movie. Oh, what was that? that? Was the name in. of that movie? Uh, it's it's escaping me right now, but I was fortunate enough to meet Jonah Ray at a convention over the summertime. I got a headshot from him and we we hung out and stuff. And it was really cool because I'm just such a huge fan of Mystery Science Theater. So it's really cool to think two of the more recent projects that they have done have featured uh, Pensacola. So anyways, oh, yeah. just a little side tangent, but uh, Thomas, <laughs> same question, sir. Uh, I've been acting for six years now and i've been very blessed to have been in a couple of feature films uh one is corsicana it premiered in august and is going to be on all of the things you can rent in digital reality uh, uh i guess you call it amazon youtube dish pay-per-view which is great because my dad has dish and his yeah. internet's trash <laughs> oh I, I said i said the a word and my alexa started yelling at me um uh, it, it actually premieres February 7th, which is very exciting. So you'll hear this and then you'll see the feature and then you'll see Corsicana. Boom. It's you're going to get a lot of my face. I'm very sorry, world. I'm very sorry. Um, but I uh, met good old Derek Diamond, the experience himself at uh, I believe it was the Emerald Coast filmmakers first get together. Um, they had a name for it. I just can't remember. Roundtable, maybe. Uh that sounds and, right. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. It was ages ago. That was pre COVID ages mm -hmm. ago. So like a whole different literal decade, actually, I think we, we started, we were just chilling and started talking about, I think Kevin Smith came up and then instant connection. Cause we were, we went right, right into a, a good old tangent for about 45 minutes to two hours. And we always kept running into each other at conventions and we worked together when he would be crew on other projects, uh, the referral, with uh by Britton Eason. Um, there's definitely a bunch more that I'm currently blanking on right now. And Home Policies, there, which is Nick Smith's short policies. he did actually yes. a month before we shot the feature. Yeah, it was it was a fun summer. I got to do a lot of different stuff. That would have talking about accents there, Leah. I was a British fellow. He Dashing. Was. He did a great some job might with it say. too. Were you really? Were you really British, fellow? I really was. Yeah, you have no idea how hard it was to keep from going one, you know, accent like a corky down to, you know, like, I'm sophisticated. Uh, it was tough because I make fun of myself all the time. Um, but we finally got to work together this summer on a project that he was creating. And we've been talking about it since pretty much the day we met. And uh, he not to brag but he's like i wrote this character with you in mind and would you well. would you believe it it's totally a stoner which is hilarious because that it seems to be what i'm always playing in this area shout out zombies <laughs> so <laughs> yeah when when i wrote the script for this even back when i wrote the first draft in early 2020 there was no one else that i wanted to play the doug character like had, thomas had you not done it I would have just rewritten it as something different because I had you exactly in mind and I didn't even audition anyone else. I just sent him the script and said, it's yours if you want it. And thankfully he said, yes. Nice. Nice. So I'm a little bit of an outsider. Like I said, I've, I've only worked uh, on the one project with, with Steve Wise, but hearing a name like Nick Smith. And then also I know that Kevin was the person that did the cinematography or the DP for your project. Um, 
These are a bunch of people that I'm peripherally familiar with. Uh, would you say that the Emerald Coast Film, what's the name of the, the Facebook page? Emerald Coast Film Group. Would you say the Emerald Coast Film Group is kind of the, uh, I don't know, the the nucleus of how a lot of these projects tend to come together? I think so, because you, you have, you know, Pensacola, you have Destin, you even got some into, you know, the Mobile area that'll comment, you know, on their projects as well. So we used to have pretty consistent meetups here in town uh, before COVID hit, and that unfortunately kind of put a a damper on that, but the Facebook group is still pretty active. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I do. Uh, it seems like that gets referenced and it kind of comes back to that on a pretty regular basis. So that's really cool. And if you are watching this and you're an aspiring filmmaker or an, an aspiring person that wants to be in the community, I think that seems like a pretty great place to start. So um, as I was kind of digging into how people got into their characters in the last couple of interviews. I, I find that very fascinating. And I'm always kind of curious how much of yourself you do bring into these roles. So um, Rob, from project to project, um, would you say that you are consistently cast as a certain kind of person or alternatively, like despite what character you do play, is there always like a core baseline of how much yourself you bring into that project? Um, like typically the villain, uh, blue collar guy, uh, anything around that spectrum is kind of, is kind of my genre. And, uh, um, I mean, it does, it, for me, it doesn't really matter in terms of kind of philosophy of acting and pro approach. It's, 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 uh, it's bringing really my full self into it and, and just, uh, um, it has so much for me to do with emotionally and perceptually where you're coming from, uh, and, and, and how you enter a scene and who you're with and how you see them, how you see the world, how you operate in that world. And, um, and, and so I, if I'm like a, uh, horrible backwoods, um, murderer guy that I was, uh, that was released last summer that I was in and, uh, you know, I have no experience at that. I mean, no. I'm not, none I'm going to admit, uh, <laughs> but, but, um, but this is someone who, who feels like he is, is justified in his beliefs and in protecting what he believes is his. And when someone, you know, intrudes upon his space or things like that. And the, so it's finding the human qualities to that and being able to express that because I know what that feels like. I'm not that guy. That's all the content, but the process. What's the process going on within him? And just finding that within me. And sure, I can be protective. Sure, I can be offended. Sure, I can get really pissed off. Sure, I can, you know, get so mad that I would just want to kill somebody, you know? And so then it's just in embodying that and layering on some of the content of, of accent, of, um, you know, uh, throwing things, of spitting, <laughs> whatever I don't know. this guy was yeah, yeah. which is the first one that came to came to my head but um but that's each one is approached that way with that you, you know focusing on the process connecting with that human experience and then layering on the content on top of that does that make sense makes a lot of sense yeah yeah absolutely um leah kind of just talking to you for a moment and and learning about your background I would almost say it's fair to say that that might kind of play into the type of character that you were cast as in this project. Um, would you would you say that maybe an exaggerated part of yourself uh, feels at home in a character like that? I like to call characters like that a yoga pants character because they're super, super easy to jump in and out of and okay. really cool to do. Because <laughs> I've, I've always loved... I've always loved playing the slightly over the top character. I, I grew up watching Carol Burnett and stuff like that. And so for me, Lucy, uh, you know, I love Lucy. And so I, I love it when you can take, you know, the, the, a sort of a classic uh, snooty female character and then just play it up and, and get the laughs. That's, that's what I I'm always aiming for. But like when it, I do get, I do tend to play a lot of characters like that. But what I try to do is find how many different ways I can add elements of myself, but also how much I can do with my own physicality. What can I, what mm. can I bring to it that I have, that I've learned or that I've seen other people do 
that would work well in this character. Whereas, you know, if I was playing something else, I would throw something else in there. I was doing one earlier this year, or no, earlier last year. Forgot we we were in a new year now, so I have to say <laughs> something else. Um, yeah, where she was like a psychic, and I was doing yoga on stage just to make people go, "What am I watching?" And it was great. So, you know, it's it's always a challenge of what can I do that's different every time, and that's that's what I try to do. But this awesome. is a character for that. Yeah, I'm also kind of curious. Uh, I, I, we spoke a little bit about it on the last interview, and I'm fascinated by the way that acting can be so dramatically different on stage versus on film. And I just kind of wanted to ask you, like, what would you say is the the biggest hurdle that you have to overcome, understanding that you do work in both, transitioning from one to the other? Um. It's interesting because a character like this, I actually got to be kind of theatrical with it because that was kind of the point. She was yeah. a little bit over the top, but a lot of it, you do have to control your dynamics and you have to control yourself within the frame that, so it's always good to know where the camera is and how much of you is in the camera. So if you're, you know, if, you, if you're doing like a medium shot, kind of like where it's set up right now. You don't want to be like doing any of this stuff. They're not going to catch that. It's just going to look stupid. So you're going to want to keep a lot of your stuff here. You want to kind of keep more of your emotions, more on your shoulders, your face, stuff like that, but also not overplay it because then it just sort of looks chaotic. Mm. Um, it's And then this, with theater, you got to find a way to bring those really heavy emotions that on camera you could play with just your eyes to the back row, to the, you know, deaf grandma that's all the way in the back. You got to bring her to tears as much as the person in the front row. So it's yeah. a, it's a really interesting exercise of what, what kind of techniques do I need to play with in this setting? So training, training is important. If you want to be in acting, you know, go do it, go for it, but get your training. <laughs> Thomas, kind of same type of question, going to reframe it slightly. You said you have kind of been typecast as the stoner guy. Um, locally, yeah. Locally. Okay, I was going to ask, yeah. in this project that's going to be premiering on the streaming services, uh, is that a dramatically different role? So different. Um, I seem to get two very different types uh, on the good side, the good guy spectrum of the world. I get uh, stoner and uncle slash dad. Um, okay. and I like to bring my funkal energy for those, uh, <laughs> okay. as much as I can. Uh, the, the film that is coming out February 7th, Corsicana, it's, um, it's a Western drama and I play a frontiers man and, um, mm, it is, um, let's say it's rated R for some horrible stuff that happens. And I'm in the scene that the horrible stuff happens in. And I had to tap into a drastically, I mean, honestly, I had to tap into my emotions. If you want to know what it's really like uh, as a comedy guy, I'm just like, I feel nothing. I will stab myself in the leg and laugh about it. <laughs> Thank you, Lucius. Shout out Talladega Knives. Mm -hmm. And then as a dramatic you know the i like to play bad guys and i like to play the comic relief i get a lot of comic relief because apparently i'm really good at it um and i'm okay with that because i grew up the clown of the class of the family if you weren't laughing i wasn't doing my job right that's kind of how i approach things and i started out doing improv um and that improv works great on stage in front of cameras uh, when I was working as uh, King Arthur and the Sheriff of Nottingham at rent fairs, when there is no stage, the world is your stage. Uh, and then I like being the bad guy and the bad guy side. Oh, that's where I really get to play and have fun. Uh, I have more fun being the bad guy than I do anything else because I have no limits. I can do whatever. I can say whatever. I can play with any emotion I want. I can be menacing. I can be so charismatic that you don't realize I'm menacing. Um, and what I like to do is in terms of the, you know, emotion, how much do I put myself into it? I would say every character I've ever played is authentically me in that moment with those emotions uh, as I would be, should it be real? Um, you know, in, in Corsicana, 
I really can't give away plot stuff because like it's so crucial to the single scene that I'm in. But like I'm there. I'm real. It's real. I'm in the pain that I'm that you feel. I'm definitely eliciting some pain uh, that, from the audience, which is the goal. Uh, as the comic relief, I am just turning off my emotions. Like I said, I'm bringing whatever dumb idea I have in my head and just saying it. Will Ferrell, Chris Farley, Jim Carrey, Adam Sandler. Like, that's what I grew up on. That is my comic side. Like, big, buffoonish, I do not matter, the character does. And then on the dark side, one of my favorite roles I ever had uh, was being this white trash i don't even know if he's white trash he was technically in college but this horrible racist character um and it was set right after all the charleston crap with the nazis coming back and for whatever reason they're still here um i was i got to play this horrible character and as a not racist person i was like well what is the what is the point well they're afraid and they use anger and hate to cover that up yes i'm using star wars as yeah. my reference point keep it together <laughs> kids and so i tapped into the hate very easily because as a dallas cowboys fan whatever the washington football team's name is now then or forever i hate them i hate them i hate them and so when i tell people that in that moment when i am yelling these obscenities and just being a horrible human being and they go like, how did you get there? I was like, oh, I was thinking about the Washington football team. And one of my best friends is a, is, is a fan of them. And he goes, I should have known better, dude. Like, of course, that's what you're thinking about. I see it in your eyes every time we say the name. Um, so it's really about tapping into the emotion of the character and utilizing. Sometimes it's very dangerous, right? It's known to be dangerous for, you know, the Heath Ledger. It's it, tapping into that emotion and digging up some event from the past Thankfully, I was just digging up hate for a football team, which is a much safer version of it than, say, what uh, what happens in Corsicana, right? Those are two dramas that I use very different approaches for for my own mental health. Yeah. OK. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Rob, you mentioned that you were kind of excited to do a, a live audition. So to that, Derek, um, what made you decide to go with the live audition as opposed to the the tape audition, right? Like the other one is you send in a you submit over tape. Mm -hmm. um, was that something that you made a conscious decision, or is it you know just simply that you had the luxury of being able to do it? Kind of talk me through that. It was a combination of both. Uh, I knew that whenever I started this project, you know, with COVID, kind of, I mean, it's still around, but it's not nearly as prevalent as it was, you know, say in twenty twenty. I wanted to feel that that kind of energy from the actors, you know, because it's different in person than it is through um, through tape, because with with the Parker syndrome, I did all taped auditions and I, I kind of came up with what I thought was a clever way to figure out the, the chemistry. I would take the footage of who I thought would work together and splice it together. So it was mm. like I was really watching a scene unfold with two characters. But I, I wanted to bring actors in so I could kind of feel what they were going to do with the characters. Because I left the descriptions intentionally vague because I wanted to see what their take on it was. Then offer some feedback if if necessary. But I, I was very lucky in the sense that I don't think I really had to do that you know, a, a ton because everyone that was cast, I think pretty much immediately understood what we were looking for in the characters. So you're able to give real time notes, obviously, if you have somebody doing a live audition and, you know, not necessarily, Hey, can you read it again? But maybe try this different, but are you able to uh, kind of adapt what it is that you want from the person? Like maybe, Maybe you get one very specific thing from a from a taping, mm -hmm. but when you've got them in person. Are you kind of able to, you know, ask real time questions and and get information from them that you wouldn't get from the taping? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, they would run through the the scene once with just you know no feedback or anything, just how they would interpret it, and then I would say, okay, I really liked this. Can you try it this certain way? Yeah. And then run through it again, because part of it also is a test to see if they can handle direction. 
Yeah, absolutely. That that makes a lot of sense. That's what I was kind of curious about, like how much of the uh, ability to be able to take those directorial notes that you would get in person versus you're just kind of going off of the pretense that they weren't able to do this tape over the course of, you know, two weeks or something like that and just really put everything into it. But then if they needed to actually evolve or, or try different things and get real, you know, feedback in the moment, how they would be able to adapt to that. So, uh, Rob, you mentioned that you you like the the live uh, auditioning process. Uh, I can imagine that it would be challenging. Um, Leah, do you have a preference when it comes to one versus the other? Is there something that's like just easier and you're more comfortable with or? I do like doing a live audition if I can. I don't care if it's through Zoom or if it's on a stage or if it's in a room, but I really do like that that live feedback. I like I like getting direction because I mean, I'm gonna direct myself as much as I possibly can, pull as much as I can out of that script, but at the end of the day, I don't know what was in their head. And so I wanna be able to take what I've got, give it to you and then get whatever it is that the director and, and everybody is giving back to me and see what I can do with that and make it different and then go from there. And um, it is nice when you're doing a self-taped audition because it does give you the freedom to kind of redo it a couple of times and perfect it and stuff like that. But sometimes it's better to just go in cold and do your best with whatever you've got to bring. I think, especially if you come from an improv background, which I do, I think it gives you a little bit more freedom to just be like, no holes barred, let's just see what happens. And it's more authentic than you. Part of it also has to be, uh, you know, from the director side of it, you're trying to figure out if your cast members are going to be able to take the direction. But Thomas, from the acting side of it, it actually gives you a bit of insight into the way that the director is going to interact with his cast as well, right? Absolutely. And that's what I love the most is uh, you can, you know, uh, when you start out acting, uh, I started out in Central Florida you might end up with a not good director, great human being, great with talking to people, but not good at directing the film. Um, and so when you're there in a live audition, sometimes you're like, oh, they're not that great at being a director of, say, actors, but they will tell you what they want and then they'll tell you if like it's not good. And sometimes that's all you need. But then there's someone who can pull the emotion out of you in a really good way. Um, and yeah, I really got to like echo the whole, uh, I like getting feedback thing. Uh, it's one of my favorite things about being on stage and doing things in front of people like improv. I, I know if I'm killing it and I know if I'm not, when I do a self tape, I, I, okay, here's, here's a, here's a bad thing. I do about 20 takes for everything. And then I have to go through those 20 takes and pick the ones that I don't hate. And then I got to whittle those three down to the one I'm sending in. And then I hate myself at the end. So it's much easier to just have the director there. And it's like, I'm not really vibing with that. And the other issue with self tapes is I have usually four to five different ways I want to play a character. But I don't necessarily want to do all four to five of those. And I find it more difficult doing it by myself. Well, I'm doing it with my friend Daphne. Uh, but it's, you know, I'm doing it all by myself in my head. I'm directing, I'm acting, I'm producing. And it's it's an absolute pain in the arse to get all of that done and then submit it and then forget about the fact that you did. 20 something takes of a character and then you know when you don't get the call it hurts even worse i yeah. wish i had a goldfish brain sometimes <laughs> yeah i can see myself doing the the process over and over and second guessing because i, mm. I feel like so much of just getting a little bit of affirmation that you're at least kind of heading in the direction that the people are interested in can can really uh you know i don't know uh incentivize you to to give your best and to kind of you know rise to the occasion so rob i you know i i'm hearing a little bit about why the uh you know auditioning in person tends to be what a lot of actors like and i do believe you you alluded to that at first are there reasons why uh the taping can actually be an asset are there some situations where you feel like the the tape is the way to go 
Well, I mean, l- let me clarify. I don't like auditioning in person. Oh, okay. So what, what drew me to this is the challenge of it. Because oh, so that. talk to me about it, that. It pushes well, me out of my comfort zone because it, in my home studio, I, so I did almost 80 auditions this past year. Mm. And, and so, I mean, I've got this thing down. I mean, I come out with two to three different takes that are very different that are good and I have this little package together and I'm very happy with most of the time with whatever I send off. And I've kind of gotten to this point of being able to like, that was its own thing that was created and it's out there and not being attached to, and oh my God, I hope I get it. You know, cause then that's when it's just like, how long has it been? And why I haven't heard from him? God, I wish I had that role. And oh, I heard that so-and-so was casting that or something. And then it just becomes this really depressing, devastating thing because you do that over and over and over again. So I've kind of I've gotten to this place that is quite different than a lot of people with um, with the video auditions. So I, I really like them. I love doing it. Um, yeah. So so it's it's different. Uh, so now ask me a question that might be helpful because that, I think I threw you off with that. No, no, that actually is really insightful. It makes a lot of sense. I I, I think the way that I perceived the the way that you accepted the the challenge of it was just slightly different but i can also appreciate that 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 makes a lot of sense to me is you you're able to do like quantity you're able to because from everything that i've heard you know you might land one audition out of a hundred submissions and if you're trying to audition for a hundred different things and you've got to do those in person that could be taxing in itself whether you have to commute to go do it that you've got this back and forth with people so by uh you know getting your system down to where you have a way that you approach it systematically sending them off to a bunch of people not taking it personally if you don't necessarily get that that seems like a uh like a pragmatic way of approaching it so what you were saying is that basically it was a unique challenge and something that you're not used to. And that in itself is something that you were excited or drawn to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to, to get, get out of that, that comfort zone and out of that monotony of doing that type of audition. And uh, yeah. And, and so my, my, you know, started in theater. And so I, and it's been years and years since I've done theater and I want to get back to that for that very reason to, to put myself back in, Kind of that whole different medium, but but uh, it, it also comes with different challenges that, that and you can really flesh out roles much more than, you know, being a day player with you know three to five lines on a you know multi million dollar set in Atlanta or New Orleans or Birmingham or wherever. And, and like you know, when you're on stage and you've got this role and it's like and you're playing you know two solid weekends and you prep prep for eight to ten weeks ahead and it's like that's a whole different vibe going on there, a whole different set of skills and challenges. Um, and I haven't had that for a long time, so that's kind of it's kind of one of my things for this year is wanting to find some time to uh, get back on stage if I can. Um, but yeah, just you're constantly challenging in the new classes and you know like Leah was saying it's like you know, anybody who's getting into this, it, it's, you know, a lot of people, I mean, there's some stuff anyway, there, a lot of people are going are getting into this for the sake of, of fame and like getting known and famous and rich and whatever. It's, it, and if that's just extraneous stuff that happens to, you know, one hundredth of 1% of people out there. And if you don't have skills to start with and passion and desire to do this and your, your passion and desire is something other than acting then you got to recognize that early on because (laughs) that's not going to work out and um so anyway that's yeah Yeah, so let me ask you this i'm kind of curious do you feel like when you do the auditioning in person when you show up to the set do you feel warmer do you feel more warmed up already because you've had this initial uh you know conversation with the people responsible for making the movie ahead of time do you feel like that can be an asset in itself not necessarily just okay. because i mean yeah with derek and, and chad yeah but it, it, that's that was different because we you know had some time and it kind of knew them somewhat and whatever but i mean most other big budget stuff it's like you you have such short amount of time and it's so impersonal anyway and you're just kind of a number that like and then once you do get cast it's a whole different I mean, you're, there's like a hundred people standing around and moving and doing stuff and you just kind of have to do your thing and you just got to be focused and kind of, so it, it's a, it's a weird, but fun game, but that, 
audition thing is um it's it's yeah you, you don't make connections right <laughs> it's like because they got 50 people for this exact same damn role that they're waiting to audition see so do your thing okay thanks we'll be in touch you know sure sure so um thomas you do have this um i, I apologize i can't think of the name of the movie it's is corsicana corsicana yes corsicana that is a pretty huge accomplishment i mean that in itself seems like you you've set out to accomplish some goals and and you know whatever we define as success i think is pretty relative to to each and every one of us but um did you feel like when you were making this movie that you that it was going to get seen by the masses and like in this particular instance has the success already come or do you feel like you've got other uh aspirations for what you want this this role to mean to you oh a layered question layered like an onion um i you know in in the moment i was like i'm, I'm so used to the short film side of things that not everything gets seen like i started out doing student films so they just get thrown up on YouTube and they're a grade for those kids or, well, most of them were like older than me, but you know, uh, it's, it's a grade. it's for grade. The professor sees it and then it's, you know, moving on to the next one. So this was my first feature film that I did in 2020 and it was a great experience. I, my goal was feature films and television. Uh, that is what I grew up on. So I wanted to be that, um, Star Wars, I'm coming for you. So now that it's out in the world, like having seen it, I'm very proud to say that it's a good movie. Like it's it's really good. It blew me away. Um, granted, I was only there for I was on set for, I think, three or four days for my scene and they shot the whole month. And so I knew nothing about the actual story, um, even though I was there as the writer and director were reworking the script because they wanted things to be a little bit more fine tuned. Um, so the fact that it's come out it's it's been getting decent praise it is the number one film of a film critics entire 2022 right that's the year we were just nice. in okay 2022 yeah. release um and i'm like hey that's amazing it's nominated for best film at the tombstone film festival and i'm just i'm just happy to be a small cog in the the machine that is that movie um and i say that because in my opinion acting is the greatest team sport that has ever been created i'm sorry filmmaking not acting filmmaking. That's a singular role. Yeah, filmmaking is the greatest team sport. I grew up playing football. I was an offensive lineman. I got zero credit for the fact that I would put three guys on the ground. It always goes to the running back, and I don't care. That's my job. I come in, I do the job, I leave. And I learned on that film that an actor is literally just there to not get in everyone else's way because crew – that is where filmmaking really sits. The lighting, the grip, the gaffers, the camera folks. Oh my God, watching them fine tune a giant dial within like a Macron or whatever they told me, I can't remember, to get the focus exactly as it needs. And the fact that they had to do that, they only took like three takes to get it right. Astounding. Um, so it's just, you know, an actor's job is to not, <laughs> excuse my French, not frack it up. Uh, yeah, because because all these people are working and they're they, they're getting paid and they're getting hired and they are there much longer hours than the people in front of the camera. And, you know, if you mess up a line for three hours, you're just holding everybody up. You're slowing down. You're wasting money. Um, and it's it's really amazing to see films that come Avatar, for example knowing there are thousands of people who touch that movie in some form or fashion. That's awesome. That is amazing. That is um, collaboration at its finest. And that's also why I love live auditions. I love collaborating. I hate doing everything by myself. You know, it's why sometimes I have such a struggle with uh, people boycotting a movie because X person was was in it when it's like so many people have poured their hearts yeah. and souls into these projects. I know subjective and completely a uh, different conversation altogether, but it's, you know, worth mentioning because like you said, it is such a collaborative process. And Leah, you have actually to the team metaphor, you've, you've 
played each and every one of the different roles. It seems like at some point uh, you said you've directed, mm -hmm. you've acted. Yeah. What other roles have you done in the, the process of filmmaking? Okay, let's see. Um, costuming. Okay. I've, I've, pretty much every show I've ever directed, I also ended up having a costume. So that's a fun game in and of itself because you're doing two very heavy jobs. Um, and I take my costuming very seriously. I want it to look good. I don't want it to look cheesy. Um, makeup, I've done sound. Not not boom sound, but like sound editing. I've done uh, video editing. What else have I done? The stage management, and then just uh, just general being a PA and a set um, like artistic designer for like one little tiny thing once where they were like, "Hey, you, can you like make this look artistic?" And I went, "Yeah." And so, yep, that's <laughs> if it's if it is a if it is something artistic and mildly techy as well as acting and directing and all that stuff, I've done it. And it's very, it's very interesting because when you get to see it from all those different sides of, of the camera, of the curtain, you know, whatever you want to look at it, it really makes you appreciate all the work that goes into it. And I find the more I've done on the other side of the lens, the better I am as an actor because I, I come very prepared and I'm I'm ready to go and I'm not doing it for me I'm doing it for everybody else to make sure that their job is easier especially editing mm. I, don't, I don't envy I, I hate I love editing and I hate it <laughs> all at the same time and I want to make yes. sure that the take I'm giving you is the best I could possibly give you so you don't have to go back and butts with it too much let me let me flip this question on its head because I was going to ask you when it's been an asset and when it's been a, like a detriment to you. Can you think of a situation where having all of that experience has been has made it difficult for you to act and not necessarily in Derek's project, but just is there such a thing as like sometimes knowing too much for your own good? Yeah, if I will say there's been some occasions where I've been okay, Derek your project was extremely professional. Like I went on that set and I was like, dang, okay, today's gonna be good. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done other things in the past where my brain would not shut up. I need, I was like, can I just please be an actor? And it's like, nope, I'm sitting there and I'm like, this is wrong, we need to fix that, we need to do that. And it, and also in a theater production, same thing. There's been times where I've I've been up there and it's awesome, and then other times where I'm, through, I need I need to turn off director brain, and I need to turn off uh, costumer brain, because they're getting in my way, and I can't just enjoy the process. I'm doing too many other people's jobs in my head that I actually can't help with. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not allowed to touch. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I could see uh, feeling similar in situations like that where you're you're here for this job, but you can't help but notice everybody else's job as well. So uh, I was I was just kind of curious about that. I appreciate the answer. Um, Derek, uh, listening to everybody talk about the way that you handled this project in particular, I think just is a testament to the fact that this was a, a finely tuned machine. I know that um, you have worked with other collaborators, you know, our mutual friend, Steve, I know that Kevin's been involved in lots of uh, different projects himself. And so there's a camaraderie there, but also I, I know that you seeked out the help of other skilled people that could make it as professional um, and smooth running of a set as possible. Um, when you decided I need to fill each of these different roles. Um, were you looking at more than just their ability to perform? Were you also looking at their work ethic, for example, and how much of that can you see in a person in the casting process? Well, and it's also, you know, you mentioning Steve, Kevin, I'll give Nick Smith a shout out as well, yeah, because absolutely. I've worked with him on numerous projects. Um, he's helped me out on both of mine. It's really, when it comes to crew, I ask them who they would recommend. And mm. then that, that trickles down because they have much more connections than I do. Cause I'm still learning, you know, with uh, learning myself um, with, with casting. And that's another reason why I wanted to do the in-person 
auditions and and Zoom also worked to a degree because you have that still kind of interaction you can really get a vibe from people of whether or not they're going to take it seriously or not. Like if, if they, the greatest validation as a director is when the cast and crew are as invested into making the project work as much as you do. And I got that from every single cast member and every single crew member that worked on the feature. And that is why it's to me successful. Like, yeah, I'm the director, but there's so many other people that, that made it, a reality and made it as good as it was. Yeah. Yeah. That actually makes a lot of sense. Um, And I, again, I think that's one of the assets of having a community and, and knowing people that are, you know, actively pursuing the same goals, because I can imagine being in a situation uh, where if I wanted to get a project going and just was like, well, I could use my friends then maybe I could get them to come in and do the best that they could. Maybe uh, they would do it as a favor to me, or maybe they would do it out of some sense of obligation, but they wouldn't be invested in it in the same way. And I think that's kind of the beauty of, of finding a community of people that do all take the craft seriously and all want to see you succeed as it helps them su- succeed. Everybody learns lessons, you know, as they go along and, It is the start of a new year. I mean, we're 10 days into 2023. We're looking down the barrel of the premiere of your movie at the Blue Wahoo Stadium. Um, You had mentioned to me that you kind of eventually want to do a feature film. Have you kind of considered, A, would you, you know, consider bringing back a lot of the same people that you've used before? And then B, have you ever thought about like shopping that kind of stuff around to streamers? Is there a place you could put a, you know, a a short film up or would you need to get to the uh, feature to do that? Um, I don't know as much about shopping a short as much as I should. I I know that they used to be big on Amazon when Prime Video really started their streaming. And in doing research, you know, when I was trying to get the Parker syndrome online, they're not as invested into that, it seems. And I, I could be misquoting that, but that's why I ended up just putting it on YouTube. Um, I, I do have, and I think I mentioned this two weeks ago, at some point I would love to do a feature version of the feature or to make yeah. it like a six episode series, because I do think there is more of the story that you could flesh out with it. So mm-hmm. uh, as far as, Shopping, I, I would probably wait until I, I get to the feature film stage to to do that. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I, I guess what I want to know is, and I, we've talked a little bit about it before, but what do you see as success for the short film version, this current iteration of the feature? What would you like to see happen to it this year? I'd like for it to have a good run in the festival circuit, and I, I feel pretty confident that it can because I, I think it it has so many things that people can relate to with the Matt and Katie relationship. A lot of people can relate to that. I think every character in this film is relatable in some way. The situations are relatable. And I think that's why, you know, I've I've sent it to, you know, some inner circle friends. I've sent it to family members just to kind of get their their feedback and they all say the same thing and it's the early feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. So I I think if I make something that people enjoy and it has a good run in the festival circuit, I would consider the feature a huge success. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree a hundred percent. And if you did get this thing screened at film festivals in the area is traveling to them, something that you would be interested in doing to kind of see how they play in front of audiences or more to the like, uh, you know, taped audition thing. Would you just like to send it off to as many places as possible and then just wait to get feedback? What what approach would you prefer? Oh, I would love to travel if I could. I love film festivals. I love the idea of them. I love going to them. They're great networking opportunities. Yeah. So any filmmakers that might be listening to this, they're great to go to to talk with other directors, other writers, so you can get feedback and you get to see your movie on a giant theater style screen, which is really cool. So I, any that are within tr- you know, decent traveling distance, I'd absolutely travel. Yeah, I host the Pensacon Short Film Festival. Uh, I've been doing it for the last nine, this will be the ninth year. Uh, and it's actually the 10 year anniversary of the convention. 
And it's always so cool to see people that will go the distance and they'll come to watch their movie get screened. And I really do wish that all of the filmmakers would do it just because to, to see that community kind of meet each other and be able to share ideas and talk about their successes and failures is just, it's such a like inspiring thing to be a part of. And on that note, I really do appreciate you allowing me to be a part of the conversation and be a part of the, the legacy of the feature, man. No, absolutely. As I mentioned in the first episode, you know, you were the first person I thought of to to do this this guest host role because you've done such a great job building up your your uh, listenership on YouTube. I know you've done some other podcasts as well, and we've worked together numerous times over the years. So, no, I, I appreciate you taking the time, and of course, thank you to you know, not just for being on the podcast, but to Rob, Leah, and Thomas for all the time and effort you put into making the feature as good as it was. Thank yeah, you. thank you all for, for being a me, part man. of it. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, really appreciate you all being here. Um, is there any social media that you would like to direct people to? Do you got a website, any of that kind of stuff, Leah? Uh, not at the moment. I'm working on <clears> one. Um, but you can go to my Instagram. Let me look up my handle because I've changed it a gazillion times. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's Leah CJ underscore 13. For now, and that's where I post a lot of my uh, theater, film, and uh, makeup work. Awesome, awesome. We'll check it out. Thomas, what about you, sir? You can find all of my links at linktree.com forward slash TC Rochester Act, T C R O C H E S T E R A C T. Um, and that is my handle on Twitter and Instagram as well. Um, but you'll see, you'll see some fun stuff on my Linktree um toilet paper jesus shout out everybody keeps singing it and i still hate the song <laughs> <laughs> rob anywhere people can check you out and see what you're up to uh facebook really rob eubanks or imdb um it's pretty much it i don't fantastic much of the other stuff and i've never heard of link tree before it's one place that? <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. thomas go ahead let them know uh, it's basically like a mini website instead of, you know, creating a website and putting all your pictures there or like bio or, oh, this feature, this this movie, this YouTube link. Uh, you get to add any link you want. So you can have like at the uh -huh. top, it'll have like your Facebook symbol and it'll they can click it and it'll take them right to your Facebook or um, you can put your IMDB link. And I have on mine, I have um, you can click and open. I think it's Toilet Paper Jesus and the referral and watch them right inside that website. Um, and I can't wait to add the feature to that link list as well. <laughs> I'm looking it up right now and I found you. Link tree is cool. amazing. Okay. It's so great. Yeah. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, thank you very much, Derek. And uh, it was a pleasure talking to everybody. Thank you once again to Jeremy Branch for stepping in as guest host, not just this week, but the past two weeks in looking back at the making of the feature and thank you again to Rob, Leah, and Thomas for taking the time to do this specific episode. Thank you to all the other cast and crew members that took time to discuss the making of the film. I know I might be a little biased because I'm the co-writer and director of it, but it was really a special project to me because it really came from, from my heart. This story, uh, the, the characters, this was just such a fun labor of love for me and hopefully for the rest of the cast and crew, even the ones that you didn't get to hear on the podcast in the last couple of weeks. And that all leads up to this Saturday, January 21st, the premiere of the feature, the Pensacola premiere of the feature will be held at Blue Wahoo Stadium inside the home clubhouse. Doors open at 6 p.m. and we'll get everything started at 6.30. We'll also be showing Those Creatures Out There, a documentary uh, showing the making of the film The Nightlings. You heard of that episode as well uh, late last week with David Vanderlyke, Chad Sanders, Ray Guillory, and Mylon Smith. We'll be showing that, and then we'll be having the premiere of the feature. We'll be doing a Q&A about the making of both films afterwards. I will say tickets are still on sale. We do have limited seating available. Tickets will not be available to purchase at the door leading up to the event. So you have to go online and get your tickets there. And the way to do that, the easiest way to do it is head over to facebook.com slash the feature movie. Click on the event page for the Gulf Coast Filmmakers Showcase and you'll find the ticket link 
inside the event page. That will be the best way and really the only way that you'll be able to get tickets. And I'll be sharing you know, the information throughout the week on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So the best way to do that is follow this show at D Diamond Podcast. Follow the feature movie on social media as well. We'll be sharing the link like crazy throughout the week. But don't forget, you have to buy tickets online. You won't be able to get them at the stadium the day of. But it should be a really fun night. It'll be a fun night not just to premiere the feature, but to celebrate filmmaking on the Gulf Coast. For next week's episode of the Derek Diamond Experience, I'll be chatting with screenwriter and screenwriting instructor Daniel Carey. He grew up in an abusive household and battled through that and is now a screenwriting instructor. He teaches classes every week in Los Angeles. He also wrote a book that we'll be talking about next week as well. I've had a lot of fun reading it, and it'll be fun to, to have a you know one-on-one conversation on the show, and that hasn't happened yet. Uh, since the show returns. So be sure to come back next Monday for that special episode. But until then, you can go to linktree.com slash ddiamondpodcast. It's where you can find uh, where to subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to YouTube, social media. Everything is at linktree.com slash ddiamondpodcast. But that's going to do it. We hope to see you this Saturday at the premiere of the feature. And we'll see you guys back here next Monday for another exciting episode of the Derek Diamond Experience Podcast. Mm-hmm.